Hey guys, so my patrons have been asking a lot of random questions. In fact, these questions are kind of old now. I apologize for not getting to them quicker. Uh, so these are random. Uh, they are also, a lot of them are either opinions, so my opinions, or trying to prove a negative or something that didn't happen. So this is going to be kind of a weird Q&A. So why not? Uh, let's crack on with it. Will has asked, Hi Lewis, I've been curious about a couple of passing references to US executions of soldiers for cowardice following the Battle of the Bulge. I think that you mentioned that the Russians weren't the only ones who had to resort to this in your Not A Step Back video, and the other might have been in the BBC Battlefield series, either the West Wall or Rhine episode. If you have any more information about this that you could share, uh, I'd enjoy hearing about it. Thanks. Okay, I did say it, and I was wrong. See, every time I admit that I'm wrong, people are like, ha that proves that he's wrong in every in single instance. It's like, no, it just means I was wrong in this instance. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that I'm wrong all the time. Or that I won't... This is like proof. Oh, see, he does admit that he's wrong, but not all the time. Like, I'm still wrong even if I admit that I'm wrong. I don't get it. Anyway, the point of the matter is, in this instance, I thought that lots of people were executed in World War II for cowardice. Turns out that's not the case. Turns out that only one person was actually executed by the United States military and or government for cowardice, as far as I'm aware, and that was Private Slovak. But lots of people did get arrested for cowardice, were sentenced to be executed, but the war ended and then they weren't executed for it. So I was wrong, but it's only because I misread <laughs> is the real reason. But here, here's the deal. There are actually instances. So Private Slovak was the only one who was executed for cowardice. And he was executed after the Battle of the Bulge. And it was a whole, well, they only did it to show, hey, we mean business. It was more of a symbolic thing rather than, rather than we're just going to, you know, execute a bunch of people. So it was more of a warning. Hey, don't do it. We, we are serious about this. Because Slovak apparently didn't feel like, he thought that he could just get arrested and that would be the end of it. He didn't think that they would actually go through with the whole execution thing, and then they did, obviously, so he was uh, not best pleased with that. But uh, it, what what is interesting is that a lot of people did get arrested for cowardice. They, they were sentenced to be executed. They weren't. But there was others who were executed. Like the, the US, United States military, did execute their own people just maybe not for cowardice. So, and there are, I've read at least one, I think two cases were the US, so a, a guy from the military would, would run away. So he was a coward. He was running away from the front line. He's going AWOL and somebody either chased after them or stopped him at like a border post or whatever and, you know, arrested him or attempted to arrest, arrest them. And then, in that instance, in this scuffle, they ended up he, the guy who was running away ended up killing the person trying to arrest him. And so in this instance, they go down and get executed for murder rather than the cowardice. So it's like, okay, they're killing him for murder rather than the cowardice, but he still ran away. Surely that was something to do with it? Like, so there were, there were executions. It just wasn't necessarily for cowardice, but then... They were running away as well, so surely they should have bumped that on. They got him for the murder charge, not the cowardice charge, whatever. The point of the matter is that, you know, I was wrong in the sense that they didn't execute lots of people for um, cowardice, running away from the line, um, taking a step back. But they were killing people for other reasons. And, yeah, I mean, we can get into an argument about capital punishment and whether it's right or wrong, whether it's right or wrong for the state to murder people rather than the individual. Like, why why is the state allowed to do it, but other people aren't? Doesn't make any sense to me, but whatever. Uh, but we won't go into that. What we will do is just go, yeah, I was wrong, and one person did get executed in World War Two, World War One, and prior to World War One, it's a lot different. Julio has asked, during the Second World War, the United States of America only had 
around 92 divisions plus the 6 marine divisions. So my question is, how did the US expect to only beat the Germany? Uh, wars end, they only had around 68 divisions in Europe. Another couple French divisions and other free European divisions. And the British, let's, let's make sure that's in there. I know from historical readings and findings, do US uh, did do US did give the Soviet much land lease? Okay, I know there's a lot that goes into war and just fighting men and tanks. So from a logistical standpoint, were US divisions uh, better equipped than the German Wehrmacht divisions? Watching military history visualized, he talked about the German divisions that were not equipped from military operations. Looking at his figures, they were alarming. I can come to the conclusion the German army was not prepared for a long drawn out conflict, which we already know, but back then did the US know this? What was the US plan if there was no Soviet and German conflict? Would they be able to add an additional 60 divisions or so because of the supplies being sent to Russia? Would the US be forced to import labor from the southern borders or amount America? Uh, many questions that really make me wonder if, sorry, my questions are all over the place. Okay, so there's a ton uh, to unpack here. Okay, I haven't looked at the actual numbers, so it, I'm assuming your 92 and 6 marine divisions is correct, and I'm assuming there's 68 divisions in Europe. Uh, I haven't double-checked, I'll be honest. Uh, there were a couple of French divisions and other free European divisions. There was also British, Canadians, others. Uh, there was a lot of Allied divisions as well, so it wasn't just the US going up against the Germans. That said, let's just assume there were 68 divisions in Europe. Um, the 68 divisions were much better equipped than the Germans were. Most of the German divisions were infantry divisions. They, yeah, they had guns, obviously. They obviously had artillery, but they didn't have much in the way of logistics. They were rel Germany relies on coal for the Second World War. Germany is still fighting a, a basically World War I kind of conflict, but with panzers at the end of it, all right? There were a handful of panzer and motorized and panzer grenadier divisions, uh, which were basically motorized divisions, but they were in the vast min minority. The vast majority of the German divisions were infantry. They were reliant on horses to get their supplies from the train yards to the front. And they didn't have trucks. They didn't have tanks. They may, depending on what part of the war you were talking about, they may have had... Uh, armored cars but later in the war they actually turned to bicycles and uh, so most of these divisions were didn't have any motor cars at all or very few and that doesn't mean they weren't reinforced with like a stug battalion or something like that that happened but for the vast majority they were not armed with tanks trucks uh, armored cars armored personnel carriers anything like that they were just infantrymen foot soldiers walking up and down and maybe with horses to draw their heavy weapons. That was it. And so even in Normandy, this was the case. And so what you, what, what you have here is the US divisions, the British divisions, the Canadian divisions, and all the other divisions. These guys have got jeeps, trucks, tanks. And not all of the divisions obviously had that, but the, like the, the British army by 1944, in fact, British army in the early part of the war was fully motorized, um, maybe excepting the uh, paratrooper divisions. I'm not sure about them, but those divisions, which weren't you know parachute divisions, they were motorized. The U.S. divisions are motorized. They've got they've got trucks. They've got uh, half tracks. They've got tanks. That's every division. You know, well, maybe not the tanks. They've got loads of vehicles. The U.S. is not fighting using coal in, in trains. It's fighting using trucks and fuel because the, the United States has the fuel and it has access to Venezuela and so does the British, so does the Canadians, so do all of them. So, yeah, there are a few infantry divisions in the mix, but for the most part, they are motorized or mechanized or armored. And so the quality of the German divisions compared to, in terms of material, compared to the Allied, the Western Allied divisions, it's just, it's, it's, it's not comparable. It really isn't. Uh, you know, people get obsessed about, oh, the Tiger tank. It's like, there were so few of them. 
Yes, they might have been able to take out, you know, five times as many tanks as they supposedly, you know, supposedly, they may have been able to take out five or so more tanks than the Allied tanks, but it doesn't matter. The, the amount of Tiger tanks available is tiny compared to what the the United States put in the field. It, it's just, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. And so, um, if you look at, I can give you an example. If you look at Operation Compass, which is the the first battle in the, the North African campaign, it was fought by the British. Now, technically the British had three divisions, but in, in actuality, they only had two in operation at any one moment of time. One got swapped out with another division. So technically it was three, but in actual reality it was two. And uh, what ends up happening is the, the British go up, their two divisions are fully motorized. One's armored, one's motorized. And they go up against the Italians and they completely destroy, you know, I think it's 12 divisions. They, they completely wipe out the Italian 10th Army, right? And they're able to do this because motorized and, and armored divisions are vastly superior to infantry divisions. Now, yeah, we could say it's the Italians, they weren't prepared for war, so on and so forth. There's loads of neat reasons as to why they dug themselves into the sand, because why? Um, and so we can argue we can have that discussion as well but the point is that it's clear that infantry and armored divisions are vastly superior to footborne infantry divisions and you see that in operation compass it's a very obvious situation and so the 68 divisions that the us puts into the field in europe are 68 motorized or mechanized or armored divisions that are toe to toe far better than the vast majority of the German divisions that the Germans put into the field. That's the reason why they could get away with it. They could get away with less divisions for that simple reason. And you really see this once they break out of Normandy. If you, so Normandy, they're kind of tightly held in, they're hemmed in by the Germans, but once they break out, they start encircling the Falaise pocket happens, and then they just race off towards uh, the Reich. Motorized and mechanized divisions you know, okay, they're trapped in Normandy for the beginning, but once they break out of that, they're, they're encircling and destroying. The, the the Germans are really they're not they're not fighting a modern war because they are without we know that this with they're out without oil, they're not fighting a modern war. They're fighting World War One, but with a couple of divisions that are Panzers um, and a couple that are Panzer Grenadier or motorized. That's it. The rest of the divisions are infantry. And so, you know, the American an American armored division has got tanks, anti tank, uh, what are they call tank destroyers, half tracks, trucks, jeeps, bazookas. You know, because that's another thing—a difference between the North African campaign, you know, Operation Compass. The infantry in the late war have got Panzerfaust and Panzerschrecks and bazookas and Piats, so they are better than they were in the early war, where you only had anti tank rifles. With, so, so the thing, the situation has changed, and the infantry are a little bit. They've got a little bit more staying power, a little bit more defensive power, but even so, they're, they're vastly under. You know, they're, they're outgunned in a sense. They're out. They're completely outgunned, and so that's the reason why it's just the equipment material advantage means that each individual soldier in the field is just it has got more firepower, and thus you don't need as many soldiers been recently doing Len Lease research and the average Soviet soldier in World War II received half the amount of food that a US soldier would consume and something similar in terms of the ordnance and the munitions and and you know the so it, an average Soviet soldier is going into battle with less rounds in his rifle than the average US soldier it has got less air Superior, you know, less air support, less artillery support on a whole. Obviously, some battles they had more, some battles they had less. But on average, the US soldiers have got much more, you know, it's a force multiplier. They've got a lot more bite to their bark, in a sense. And so, and I don't know what it is for the German um, soldier. I haven't come across statistics for that, but I suspect it's something similar to the Russian, you know, or the Soviet. I, I suspect maybe slightly higher. But the point is that, it, you know, the, the, the US soldiers 
are more capable. Okay, they might be green. They might not be as veteran or as, you know, maybe well-trained as the Germans might potentially be. I don't know about that. So, fine. But the the US soldiers can put more bullets in the air, and that means a lot more in a war where you need bullets and bombs and whatever else. So the US divisions each were, were tougher. And that's before you get to the actual how many troops are in the divisions because the German divisions are actually under strength at this point. They've not, they're running out of men. Uh, the panzer divisions are going in with panzers and little elements of men, but they're getting taken out because, you know, combined arms, you need infantry, tanks, artillery, air power. The, the Germans just don't have that anymore. So they're going in with the odd tiger, the odd panther the odd panzer four it's not enough it, it just isn't enough so the germans are logistically outdone by 1944 at least uh they are the munitions wise they're outdone the u.s divisions have just got more firepower that's that's it they've just got more firepower more maneuverability overall and and you see this in the back this idea that the germans you know, were these amazing great defenders? I, I, yeah, to some extent they probably were. They were veterans. They did they did well for what they had, but they were just they were just every action where they did well. It's like you just it, the the tidal wave is coming, and you just kind of you know, oh, we've given yourselves a few more minutes, a few more hours, a couple of days. You know, that's they're just del- delaying the inevitable because the U.S. just had more. Um, and we'll get onto the Lend-Lease in a minute, but yeah, that that. And the British are the same. The British have tank, 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 tank. Um, their divisions are motorised. The Canadians are the same. And so they don't need as many troops in the field. They don't need as many divisions. But then you say about, well, what happens if the Russians weren't there? Would, the, would they have had 60 other, you know, would the US have had to make another 60 divisions or could they? Well, whether they could or not is, I don't know, if I'm honest. However, what's interesting, so... There is the, the idea put forth by the Soviet historians is that Len Lees it helped, but it wasn't wasn't a war winner. It, it didn't prop up the Soviet Union. Okay, so I've been doing a little bit of research on that. Now, what's interesting? There is a uh, discussion between Roosevelt and Molotov. 1942, I think, where Molotov is informed by Roosevelt. You know, Roosevelt goes to Molotov and goes, hey, you know, you've been asking for this second front for so long. You've been begging for it. Well, what we're going to do, we're going to reduce lend lease supplies for six to eight months so that we can launch our second front in 1943. Yay, good news, Molotov. And Molotov goes, oh, no, 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 keep giving us Lend-Lease. We want more Lend-Lease. We do- no, no, forget the second front. Uh, second front's not as important. We need, we need more Lend-Lease. Give us more. In fact, you should increase the amount that you're giving us. Wait a second. I, I thought Lend-Lease wasn't that important. Right? And this is, this is the argument made by some of the historians. It's like, wait a second. If Lend-Lease wasn't that important, why was Molotov so eager to have more lend lease come to the the Soviet Union, then launch an entire second front, maybe even earlier, maybe in 1943. What what the heck's going on here? And I'm going to do a bigger video on this, uh, I think. But th- this idea that, well, if there hadn't been a, a Soviet front, let's just say, the US could have put a second front earlier or could have built up more divisions for the war in Europe. That could have happened. And this is proof that it might have all, you know, it's hard to say what would have happened because it's, we can't predict the future, right? But, or see the past in a different, you know, an alternate timeline. But if, if the U S wasn't sending Russia or the United States, uh, USSR, uh, Len Lease, then potentially they could have had a second front in 1943, going off this one instance with uh, with Molotov and Roosevelt. 
So that's something to mill over because it's kind of like, ha. Huh, maybe maybe they had delayed it to 1944. They might have needed more divisions and they could have actually recruited more divisions. It's hard to know, but I'm just saying that actually that's something to mill over. As far as did the US know whether the Germans uh, weren't ready for a long drawn out war? Well, the British in 1941, I think. Yeah, uh, they said they found out about the rationing of oil in Germany and the British commented saying it was ridiculous, basically. It was, uh, it was basically starvation rations for oil. So the British knew that the Germans weren't motorised, mechanised and were suffering under an oil shortage. It's hard to see that the US wouldn't know that. Uh, and would the US be forced to import labour from the southern borders? I don't know. But I I uh, hope this kind of answers your questions. Tim has asked, what would happen to Swiss with major Soviet formations moving to the north of it and the same time the Warsaw Pact force is heading for its eastern border? Is there Was there any plan for Swiss to coordinate with NATO or was it a general case of make the best of a bad situation? The Swiss seems to be under no illusions of who their enemy would have been if the balloon did go up, but what were they going to do? Obviously, this is something of a worst-case scenario. So the Swiss were the last country to go off the gold standard. I believe they only they came off it in 2003. So I don't think they're really Soviets. <laughs> uh, I don't. I think they're more capitalist. Uh, they're not socialists. So I don't think they would have sided with uh, the common turn. Would they have sided with NATO? Well, I'm not so sure about that. From what I've read online, which is not great, but from what I've read online, even in World War II, the Swiss had a plan to just fall back into their own borders and hold an inner circle, uh, what they call the red out, inside their territory, which is basically... I wouldn't say a marginal line, but a bunch of fortifications within their borders, guarding the um, the mountain passes within their territory. Would they have struck towards Moscow? I don't think so. I think they were looking for purely defensive purposes. Um, that doesn't mean that they wouldn't have allowed, in the event that they would have been attacked, they wouldn't have, wouldn't have allowed, you know, Western allies to come in and help them out. I'm pretty certain that would have happened, but. You've got to think from the Soviet point of view, why would they attack Switzerland? I don't know, let's take a million losses to get a mountain? Like, I, I don't know. Um, so, I, I mean, this is a what-if scenario. I have no... Guys, help Tim out. You, you know more about the Cold War. Let me know in the comment section below what you guys think, because I... I don't know, is the honest answer. <laughs> so, Olaf... Um, asked, given the fact that the Allies broke the German codes, the British were able to warn the Russians of the troop build-up around Kursk. Uh, how come the Germans were able to surprise the Allies at the Ardennes and around Arnhem? This is actually answered by Yogi Khan, who said, If I remember correctly, Germans did not use radio communications and used direct hand-carried orders and the telephone system. Since it was not radio traffic, it could not be intercepted. So that explains it for the Ardennes, but not really the, Ar the Arnhem sector. I don't think the Allies were surprised in the Arnhem sector. They knew that the tanks were there. The, the whole point of, um, uh, what's his name? Not General Urquhart, but Major Urquhart, the intelligence officer, who goes up to Browning and goes, hey, there's tanks in this area, and Browning dismisses him, and there's a whole, it's shown in the film. You know, the, the, the Allies knew that the tanks were there. It's just they didn't tell the troops, because probably because hey, we're going to be, the tanks are going to be with you in two days anyway. I'm sure you can survive two days against the Panzers. And also, uh, you know, they don't want to destroy morale. So, I mean, Frost says at one point in his, I think it's his memoirs, where he says, um, uh, actually, if we had known that there's going to be Panzers, we would have traded more, we would have traded our mortars and get, taken more Piats, you know, uh, so they did. They didn't. The, the higher command knew, but the the soldiers didn't. So that's more of a. There it, it wasn't really the failure of 
uh, intercepting the communications. It was more of a, actually, they just didn't pass the information on to where it needed to go. But yeah, in terms of the Ardennes, the German high command kept it all hush-hush. Uh, the, there was radio silence, you know, and all this stuff is very effective. And so the Allies supposedly didn't know about it. That makes sense to me. And I think it was because they could, if the yeah the telephone system you see this at uh, in a few instances when the Germans fall back into their own territory they're using the telephone system and it's the Allies can't intercept that so they're kind of the le- when the fighting outside their territory the Germans have got a disadvantage because the Allies can break their communications once they fall back into Germany they can't do that so that's interesting but by that point it's too late anyway. Todd has said, Good evening again, sir. I just watched your video, uh, the extreme fuel crisis that Germany faced during the war. I thought your information and analysis was outstanding. However, I question if I may, Germany was and remains renowned in the fields of chemistry and engineering. I know they had an ersatz fuel industry, but I just find it perplexing that the use of alcohol made from bio waste, etc., was not used in uh, to run engines in at least the wheeled vehicle fleet. I would think this would have been uh, just a matter of relatively simple chemistry, some mechanical engineering and producing it to scale. Surely Albert Speer could have made a decent effort at this. Your thoughts? Thank you. There is a few elements to this. So, one, uh, as far as I'm aware, they didn't make alcohol run vehicles but they did make uh, there's a website I'll, if i remember i'll link it uh they did make gas powered vehicles the problem with that being if you shoot the gas the vehicle goes up in flames so as far as i'm aware they only used it behind the lines uh as logistics or uh as training vehicles they didn't actually use them on the front line now i'm not sure if alcohol is the same as that but yeah, it's like, why didn't they use alcohol? Well, there's a, probably a couple of reasons. Uh, could they have made enough alcohol? Um, Germany, see, I didn't mention it in this particular video, but recently I've kind of mentioned it uh, in my Why Hitler Went to War video. Germany was suffering under a food crisis as well as a uh, oil crisis. The two big ones are fuel and oil. Uh, food and oil. Uh, so, would they have? Would it have been wise for the Axis to convert their food industry, where they are suffering a shortage anyway, to producing alcohol-based products for their motor vehicles? I don't think so. Uh, Hitler's stab in the back idea. He right up until the end. He wants to keep the people happy, so that's why he's stealing food from everywhere else and putting it into Germany uh, to keep them happy because he doesn't want to stab in the back like he supposedly thinks happened in World War One. Well, right up until the middle of the Battle of Berlin, uh, the Germans were still producing beer. You know, they they didn't close down the alcohol producing breweries in Berlin because they the. Hitler has this mentality of, well, we'll keep the soldiers and the people happy. They won't rebel against me. So would they have really converted that? You know, would they have taken the alcohol away from the people, made them all upset? Probably not. Um, Albert Speer. I mean, this is late in the war. Why didn't they do it earlier? Well, let's look at Albert Speer. The problem with a centrally organized, planned economy um, was numerous reasons. But the problem is, is that unless somebody goes... This is a good idea. It doesn't happen. So in a market economy, um, what happens is, let's say fuel prices go up, people start using alternative means um, because of the scarcity. So they start going, well, instead of using my car, I will use public transport if it's cheaper. Oh, instead of using my car on public transport, I'll start using the bike or walking, so on and so forth. When coffee goes up in price, people turn to tea. When tea goes up in price, people turn to coffee. And there's alternatives. And so in this situation, if there's no fuel, then people would turn to something else. Well, that didn't 
really happen. I mean, they use the trains, but they didn't really happen because this is essentially ran economy. Um, the trains were uh, uh, nationalized in 1937. The, you know, Gunter Ryman shows this throughout his entire vampire economy. It's just, there is no, you can't do anything without the state's permission. So there is no, I mean, as far as I'm aware, there is no industry in Germany about making alcohol into fuel. And if there was, it's going to be pretty hard for it to, 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 expand to the way it's necessary to do it so i think there's a there's a numerous reasons as to why this wasn't a thing even if it could have been a thing but i'm not an engineer i'm not a chemist uh, so i don't know the ins and outs of it but i would suspect that there's a few reasons as to why this wasn't practical chadwick has said hi tick i really enjoy the detail in your videos well done i'm excited to support your excellent productions I've been reading a bit on German strategic bombers, or lack thereof, when Barbarossa offensive boot bogged down. I'm curious on your thoughts if General Weaver had not died in a plane crash, uh, would having strategic bomber capabilities change the outcome, i.e. being able to reach to interdict oil and lend lease supplies fr uh, from Baku area, disrupting manufacturing and potentially destroying manufacturing and demoralizing Moscow? Again, this is trying to prove a negative because it didn't happen. So it's, you know, was this a mistake? Um, so Germany in the early war period has to prioritize tactical bombers, uh, fighters. Yeah, Germany's more looking for the quick win rather than the strategic capability. And I don't think one guy dying in a plane crash would have really changed things too much because you've got to have the whole, you can't just like, Here's a bomber. You have to actually produce it. You have to have a factory. You have to have an infrastructure there to produce it. So it clearly, I mean, they, they didn't prioritize strategic bombers. They just didn't do it. So I think one guy wouldn't have changed it anyway. But um, would have, if that had been the case, would it have changed the outcome of the war? Well, Britain was supplying Lend-Lease through Murmansk. The, so, the, I mean, potentially they could have stored a bunch of strategic bombers in Finland and hit Murmansk or the railway, uh, or they could have just gone to the railway. That's, didn't, they didn't do that. Um, they went south, and that's to do with the Finns. So there's a few things there. But uh, the Persian Gulf and the uh, Iranian or Persian uh, route supply route only really comes into into play later on in the war uh, 19 late 42 1943 onwards partly because the soviets don't really think that the americans and british can set it up so they're like yeah we'll be fine we, we won't prioritize it and then there's a bottleneck because the british and the americans are supplying up through there and the 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 soviets are like We've not set our infrastructure up. We can't just take it all. You know, it's a it's a bit of a cock up. Uh, so, actually, that would would have it helped if if they could have bombed it. Yeah, I mean, hitting Baku would have been a big problem. Um, uh, so that's an issue. But actually, a lot of lend lease came direct from uh, across the Pacific to uh, Vladivostok. Now, the Japanese had a deal with the Soviets saying only non-military supplies can go that way um, and they have to put uh, Soviet flags on the ships so that we don't hit them. So only food, metals, that sort of thing could actually go that way. So military supplies still had to go through Mamansk and across the Arctic or through the... Um, through the Persian Gulf. So yeah, obviously having hitting those other areas might have done, but a lot of lend lease actually came direct uh, and there's no way the strategic bombers would have hit that. So would it have changed an outcome? I mean, they hit, I think they hit Moscow anyway with tactical bombers. Would it have hit, would it have demoralized Moscow even more? My question would be, would it have even mattered um, if moral, uh, morale had dropped in Moscow? I, I don't think strategic bombers were the answer. Um, at all, I don't. I I think strategic bombers 
throughout the whole war. Yeah, they had their impact. I don't think they were they were war winning, and I think it just would have been another waste of resources. If I'm honest, I don't. I I don't know. I'm not. I'm not. Air power to help the ta- on the tactical level and the operational level, yes. Strategic bombers, eh. um, guys. Again, let us know what do you think. I, th- I think it's trying to prove a negative again, but I don't think one guy getting killed in a plane crash changed the course of the war or changed the strategic capabilities, strategic bomber capabilities of Germany. I don't think that happened. I think I think it just wasn't prioritised like the Western Allies prioritised it, for example. And finally for today, Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> uh, this might be a tricky one. Chemical weapons were used during the Great War, so why weren't they also used during World War II on the battlefield? Did everyone just scrap them between the wars, or were they deemed not worth it? I have heard that they were too horrifying to use, but I did find it a bit hard to believe. Japan used chemical weapons in World War II. Italy, did they use it in World War I think they used it in uh, Yugoslavia, but they, Italy used chemical weapons in uh, Ethiopia and prior to the war in Libya against the tribes there. The Germans used gas, I believe, at Odessa. Or was it Sevastopol? It might have been both. Uh... At Odessa, there's actually creepy underground... I think it's Odessa. They have creepy underground places. I've seen videos online. Uh, where there's like hundreds of miles of different evil catacombs and stuff. Weird stuff. Uh, so, yeah, people go down there on tours and then get lost and die. Uh, so they use gas down there, apparently. Um, the US had... I think I might have read this off Wikipedia, which isn't the greatest source in the world, but I'll go with it because I, you know, I've not come across much in my books. Um, the US had a ship at the port of Bari in Italy in 1942 or 43 that got hit and gas exploded. Like they had, it stored gas on the ship. The ship got hit by a Stuka or something like that, blew up. The gas spread everywhere, and then several hundred people died. And so the reason, so the U.S. had gas. Obviously, the British had gas from the First World War. The Germans used gas. Japanese used gas against the Chinese, not against the Westerners. And so my conclusion is, the powers that had gas were happy to use it against those that didn't have gas, but not against those that did. And I think the reason why is because they feared retaliation. Because can you imagine Germany using gas in World War II? Let's say on, the, I don't know, Normandy. And then the week after, Berlin is hit by a gas attack. Because, yeah, that's not good, is it? So, I I, th- I think, I think the Axis were like, mm, let's not use this against the powers that have gas. And I think the Allies were like, well, we're not going to use it unless they, they use gas. Uh, the Soviets are not sure what happened to them. Did they? I don't think the Russians had gas in World War One. I. I assume they had gas in World War Two, but whether they used it or not, I don't know. Um, but I think it's just simply because of the retaliation. If if you use gas first, you're going to get hit. It's, it's kind of like the Cold War. Whoever uses that nuke, you're going to get. It's mutually dis- mutually assured destruction. All right. That's the way I'm going with it anyway. So thank you, Jeremy Corbyn, for your for your uh, revolutionary question. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.